Okay. I should be going. It's telling me. I get the impression that we're live already. David, if you can confirm, we're set. We're live. Okay. Hello, Eduardo. Who's telling me hello? Hey, Sarah. Good morning. How are you doing? Pleasure. Hi. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. So, Thank you for hosting this. Wonderful. Our pleasure. So we're live. So this is when we stop cursing and talking <laughs> bad about our other colleagues and friends. <laughs> uh, and we'll just give it one more minute in case somebody's showing up and joining us sharp at 11. Uh, wonderful to see some new faces. Uh, we've made a big effort in the last many weeks to reach out all over the world. And the, the efforts paid off. I know myself in particular, I've been trying to reach out to my colleagues in Latin America. And we saw, I think 20, 30, 40 new people a behavioral ecologist from Latin America signing up for the fine seminar. So it's been fantastic. And in many cases, many, many students as well. So uh, like I was telling students yesterday, the, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Uh, so <laughs> it, it's, it's paying off. Uh, as a, a reminder, I need to do that as well. Uh, I'm going to mute everyone as you come in while we get yeah. ready. Uh, and it's now 11, so I, I think we can start, uh, we can get started. Uh, I want to welcome you all to the second week of this uh, fine seminar series, which we started to, with Lauren and Karsten last fall. They were kind to invite me to join them, and it's been a pleasure, it's been a lot of fun. And we were up to a fantastic start last week. And I'm sure that's going to be followed by Susan Perry's presentation today. Uh, before I go on to introducing her, uh, I just want to have a couple of announcements regarding how we get organized. An announcement that I'll repeat uh, after the talk and before the Q&A, they are important. Uh, on Sunday, the United States of America changes the time, which means that beginning next Tuesday, we will meet at 1100 hours New York, and it will be 1600 hours Paris, France. So please take note of that. Of course, that we will make the announcement clear in the message. Uh, again, I, I mentioned it now, again, when we finish next week, we have somewhat of a different meeting, and I hope you'll join us, and I hope you'll reach out to your colleagues and friends who are educators. Next week, and I have here, I want to reach you, what we have is a fine working group report. This was an initiative uh, led by Lauren, and we've been working for several months now developing a strategy and developing tools to use remote seminars to teach animal behavior. So Lauren Heiss next week will be uh, reporting, will be sharing with the community the progress we've made in implementing these new strategies for bringing animal behavior to the classroom. Along those lines, one of the things that we decided to do, and I want to share with everyone, we thought that it would be fantastic is former and current fine speakers were willing to be included on a list that we will make available in the new website of the fine seminar where anyone can go and see who are the former and current speakers who are volunteering their time to visit your classroom. And by that, I mean that uh, we've done it already, the three of us, it's been fantastic. But, but we want to be on a list on the website. So if, if, you, if you presented at FINE last semester, you were presenting this semester and you haven't got back to us, I would like to be included on that list. Please uh, let us know. Uh, I think that those are the announcements that I have. Uh, for those of you who are new to the series, the Susan Perry, whom I will introduce in a second, will be talking for 45, 50 minutes. And after that, we'll transition to a one hour question and answer session. And I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some instructions on how we operate the question and answer session when we're getting ready to start that. Now, I would like to introduce Susan, my, my friend, my colleague. Uh, Susan is professor in the Department of Anthropology 
at the University of California in Los Angeles. And she's the director of the Lomas Barbudal project. For 30 years, 31 years, more than 30, 31 years, she's been in charge of developing one of the most comprehensive, longest field projects of any non-human primate in the world, the Capuchins of Lomas Barbudal. And I know, because I know her, that you will get a lot of detail and a fantastic mix. I was going through the CV, right? And the challenge is, okay, what can I say that makes Susan different from other people? And, and as I was browsing her CV and, and the website for a project, I think that Susan really captures two crucial elements of what we're trying to emphasize it's important in behavioral ecology. You'll get a lot of natural history, detailed recordings of what the Capuchins done, thousands, thousands and thousands of behavioral observations of lots, lots of individuals carefully uh, individualized. And that has provided an awful lot of information and exciting information that she has also examined, of course, through very, very thorough methodological approaches. Uh, I feel comfortable saying that Susan has set up the standards so high in terms of how we standardize Behavioral, behavioral methodologies uh, among, among those of us doing field primate studies. So uh, I, I, I'm sure we will enjoy the, the presentation. She has so much to tell us. Uh, the capuchins are very, very interesting for those of you who, who study social evolution in other groups of animals. Uh, we've always heard about them having a relatively large brains in the, in the context of all mammals. Uh, they they use tools. I mean, one of the few non-human primates in the Americas that unequivocally use tools and they have social traditions. And I will leave you with this. I didn't know which of these social traditions we'll hear from Susan, but what I'm gonna say is the following. If you're gonna Google some of these social traditions, be careful because I don't know where you may end up. Let me just mention the names of the social traditions that she has on the website. You have hand sniffing. You have sucking of body parts, finger in mouth game, hair in mouth game, toy game. And the one that I really like, and you may not find in those websites that you do not want to go for this, is eyeball poking. So I'm sure that Susan will share some of those traditions with us while she presents the, the talk she's going to share with us today, titled Determinants of Behavioral Variation in Wild White Face Capuchins at Lomas Marabudal the challenges and value of long-term field studies. So with that, welcome Susan. Thank you very much for joining us and please, it's all yours. Uh, you need to unmute. You're still muted. You're muted, Susan. You guys hear me say that she's muted? Yes. Susan, you're muted. Uh, okay, let me see if I can take control. Huh, I'm not finding how, Susan, you're muted. She's saying that she knows she's muted, but I can't see what she's saying after that. Uh, yes, I know that I should be able to unmute her because I unmuted her, uh, but uh, what does it, what does the it say? The cursor won't work. Oh, gee. Why don't we stop, stop sharing and let's start again. Okay, you know what, let me, I'm going to share my own screen and that will stop her. And I want to, uh, okay, Susan. Can you unmute all of us and then we could mute ourselves? Maybe that'll unmute her. Okay, I think I've unmuted myself. I just had to... Okay. The, so let me, uh, you still, you're still a co-host. 
So you should be able to share now. And I have witnesses. We practiced yesterday evening. We practiced today at 10 in the morning. So there we go. We need you to go full screen. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for the invitation to speak in this series. And I've really enjoyed the talks I've attended, especially those that talk about the behind the scenes details of how people's methods work in these long-term studies. So I hope in the question and answer session, we can talk more about uh, the, the methods that we've used in, in my project that might be useful to other people. So here are some of the goals I have in this talk. I'm gonna start by presenting my research questions. I'll describe the natural history of the Lomas Capuchins that I think will be of most interest to this audience. And then I'll present some results from my current research on the dynamics of cultural evolution. And along the way, I hope to describe those aspects of my data collection that are perhaps unique to my site that enable this detailed research. So here are some of the primary research topics. I started this project in 1990 with a detailed investigation of the social dynamics of a single social group. And it gradually expanded both the range of topics and the number of social groups monitored. My two primary topics during the last three decades have been life history strategies and the dynamics of cultural evolution. I've worked on communication and behavioral endocrinology a little bit, but won't talk about those today in the interest of time. With regard to life history research, my collaborators and I study both male and female reproductive strategies. And I've been working on a long-term study of social development begun in 2001, which relates closely to my other goal of understanding how learning strategies change across the lifespan. So a portion of the population has been the subject of really intensive focal observation from birth till death or dispersal, while other individuals are the subject of more sporadic focal sampling, depending on current grant topics. But what I'm most excited about and most actively pursuing right now is this study of the dynamics of cultural evolution in the wild, which focuses on the selective pressures affecting variation at the level of the behavioral trait, individual diet and group. I'm particularly interested in how the processes of innovation and social learning can shape behavioral repertoires, both at the level of the individual repertoire and the group repertoire. I'm also interested in how learning strategies shift over the course of the lifespan and their relationship between life history strategies and learning strategies across different species. So I'm hoping I can persuade some of you and particularly those of you who do not study primates to become interested in asking some of these same questions in your own study organisms. I'm currently establishing a working group of both modelers and empiricists interested in these kinds of questions. So here's my study site. It's a mixture of riverine forests, it's quite steep forested hills and pasture land. And it includes the biological reserve Lomas Barbudal and several far farms, private farms and ranches. And the monkeys use all of these habitats so they prefer the forest to the pastures. So to give you a rough idea of the kinds of data we collect, we have collected nearly 111,000 hours of behavioral data over the past 31 years, which includes focal follows, group scans, ad lib data, and special protocols for food processing and conflicts. We have genotyped the monkeys at 18 microsatellite, microsatellite loci, which enables us to construct the genealogy so we can get both maternity and paternity from that. Of course, we conduct censuses of the groups as we encounter them and we monitor 13 groups and so far have 748 monkeys in our database. We sometimes collect audio recordings and video recordings, mainly for documenting behavioral repertoires. Occasionally we'll collect fecal samples for our behavioral endocrinology projects. And we regularly collect personality assessments. So starting in 2001, every time uh, an intern left at the end of their year, they would uh, rank all of these individuals that they knew well with regard to various personality traits. Some of which we validate with, with assays of focal data. We also carry Garmin navigators around with us so we can document the home ranges of these groups. And sometimes we conduct field experiments and I'll only talk about one of those today. 
So capuchins live in multi-male, multi-female groups composed of about four to 39 individuals and they live a long time. So um, in, in captivity, they can live up to 55 years. In the wild, it seems that they live into their upper thirties maximum. Females start reproducing around age five and a half or six and males a bit older than that. So far, it seems like the maximum number of offspring is 13 for females and 27 for males. Some of the most interesting aspects of capuchin natural history, aside from these slow life histories, I think are the large brains, which Eduardo mentioned. They do have tied with squirrel monkeys, the, the largest encephalization quotient of any non-human primate. They form coalitions all the time, sometimes for really silly reasons, like to threaten piles of poop. And these large brain size and coalitions together mean that the competition for males is not just about physical competitive ability, but also about political skill. They do a lot of alloparenting, uh, not perhaps as much as the marmosets and tamarins, but, but quite a bit, including allo nursing. And I'm particularly interested in uh, the sharing of information. They have really complicated kinship structures with high, degree to, high degrees of relatedness. So much higher uh, average relatedness within group than most mammals. And this is partially due to the long alpha male tenures and high reproductive skew. So both sexes maintain close relationships with the same sex kin throughout the lifespan. Um, males do that by co-dispersing and females accomplish it by um, staying home. They're the philopatric sex. So the females preferentially associate with their matrilineal kin with regard to uh, time spent together, grooming. They also uh, support their kin in coalitionary uh, aggression. And so they support matrilineal more than patrilineal kin. Our long-term research has given us a population level view of the effects of female philopatry on uh, the, the um, overall group structure. What you see here is uh, the group sizes and fissions as our study has progressed from, two, from 1990 to 2021. So you can see that Abby's group has fissioned one, two, three, well, four times um, and same for um, Rambo's group. And then you can also see that we have had, oh, oh, I should say that these splits are along match lines. So the female philopetry and the preference for close female kin is expressed here. Um, we had one group fusion when the group size dwindled to four, which only had one female and she followed her male relatives as they dispersed to a new group. Male careers are particularly interesting and I've done a lot of research on that. They uh, emigrate for the first time around age 7.6 years, it varies from around two to 14. And then they, they disperse multiple times throughout their lifespan. They have parallel dispersal with other males up to groups of eight males who co-emigrate. And the mean relatedness of those co-migrants is 0.28. And it's common to spend a lot of time in all male groups before settling somewhere to reproduce. Alpha males monopolize reproduction. And as I was saying, they can stay alpha for up to 18 years, which is three generations. And they receive a lot of aid from subordinate males, most of whom are their kin in defending their positions from outside males who want to come in and overthrow the alpha male. Infanticide is a really common male reproductive strategy for new alpha males and is the most common source of infant mortality. Coalitionary aggression from other males is the most common cause of adult male mortality. In this slide, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, how these monkeys are embroid inbreeding. So uh, Irene Godoy and Laura Muniz are two former graduate students of mine who did their work, their genetic work in the lab of Linda Vigilant. And so they're the ones who have figured out the kinship structure of the group. Um, you know, normally, I, Father and daughter inbreeding avoidance is avoided by one sex dispersing before the other sex matures reproductively, but we don't have that situation so much in this species. However, it does look like they have worked it out somehow. Um, alpha males monopolize the reproduction with all of those females who are not their descendants. So you can see they've got 92% of those matings here. However, with regard to those females who are the daughters or granddaughters of the alpha, the subordinate males do almost all of the breeding there. So this slide in a very rough sense represents the genetic structure of this population. So we do not study these white circle groups, but we do study all the others intensively. 
the red lines here show where there's been a fusion, I mean, a fission. And so these groups connected by red lines are pretty closely related in terms of matriline. The purple arrows show the male dispersal. Of course, not all of these dispersal events result in actual breeding because not, not all of the subordinates get to breed. Um, I also want to point out that sometimes the alpha males, when they stay in place a long time, have tremendous genetic influence. So for example, the alpha male of Pallone group stayed there for 18 years, produced 27 offspring, and these sons went off to also monopolize reproduction in all of the green groups. Similarly, for Rambo's group, uh, the alpha of that group uh, produced sons who were alphas and monopolizing reproduction in these other groups. So this resulted in just tremendous uh, genetic contributions. So now that you know a little more about the natural history of the species and our research setting, let me tell you a little more about the work I'm doing with regard to cultural dynamics. So um, we want to understand the selective pressures affecting behavioral innovation and social transmission. At the level of the behavioral trait, some kinds of behaviors are easy to invent, for example, because they're similar to items already in the repertoire, whereas other behaviors are not. Similarly, some behaviors are easy to transmit socially, perhaps because they're less complex, whereas others are not. With regard to the second question, individuals also vary with respect to their capacity to invent new behaviors, their power to influence others to adopt their practices, and their ability to learn from others. Some relevant behaviors or re relevant variables might be age, sex, dominance rank, personality, and position in a social network. Younger animals in some species are perhaps more open to trying new things and more creative, but of course, less experienced at problem solving generally. At the level of the dyad, the quality of the relationship may have implications for whether information or practices are transmitted effectively. Relative ages and ranks matter. Some personalities may be incompatible and the history of the relationship may make it easier or harder for naive individuals to relax in close enough proximity to see the important details of behaviors so that they can learn them. The size and composition of a group as well as the structure of the social network may also have important implications for the spread and maintenance of behavioral traits. The age composition of a group is likely to be particularly important with regard to the rates of invention, transmission, and maintenance of behavioral traits, yet this is rarely considered in models of cultural evolution. Clearly this research agenda I just laid out could consume multiple academic careers and I can't do it all myself, nor can I present on all of it today. So I'll focus on these questions today that are in uh, red here. So how do behavioral repertoires and learning strategies change throughout the life cycle from birth up to the time uh, someone is a grandparent? A closely, um, closely related question of interest to scholars is this issue of how behavioral repertoires change throughout the life cycle. And presumably the content of behavioral repertoires changes with age because the needs and abilities of the individuals change. Maturing individuals acquire better motor and cognitive skills. Their personality traits and motivations shift a bit as they age. They acquire new knowledge and their methods for acquiring knowledge. That is their learning strategies change along with these other trait changes. Many scholars of animal learning have suggested that variation in individual personality traits is likely to affect learning strategies. In this slide, you can see how various personality traits relevant to learning shift with age. These data are scored on a five point scale and they're from those personality questionnaires that my interns fill out at the end of their time with us. So we had 84 researchers who knew the monkeys well contributing here. So what you see here in these graphs are model predictions with 95% confidence intervals from a linear mixed effect model, which includes monkey identity, radar identity, and monkey age slope as random effects. So individuals who are older uh, turn out to be less active, more alert, less curious, less opportunistic, more neophobic, less playful, and less creative. And these results are what you'd expect if young monkeys are more prone to innovate. These results are consistent with the work of developmental psychologists working on humans who find that younger learners are more curious, open and creative in their approach to problem solving. Whereas older individuals tend to stick with tried and true solutions. So in order to answer these questions about changes in behavioral repertoire across the lifespan, 
and the means by which new behaviors are incorporated into individual and group repertoires, we need to have an exceedingly detailed data collection protocol with rigorous inter-observer reliability protocols applied consistently across decades. These data are primarily collected by groups of interns from around the world, most of whom stay for a year or more. And so achieving inter-observer reliability is a really major issue for us. I'll briefly explain here what kinds of data we collect and how we collect them. And I'd be happy to talk more about the training, the inter-observer reliability and the project's database during the question session if people are interested. So we collect data, not with a single observer during a focal follow-up, but with teams of two or more people. So the spotter is narrating what the monkey is doing, kind of like a sports announcer, while the typist is, is recording all of this using a system of coding, which we've developed for this project. And this is great because, you know, the monkeys are moving pretty quickly. And when the spotter set needs to take their eyes off the monkey to climb a cliff or something, they can ask the typist to watch the monkey while they get in a better position to see. And we also have these uh, recording devices if things get really fast so that the, uh, too fast for the typist so the spotter can record all that fast action and we can transcribe it in later. So we collect various kinds of behavioral data, group scans we collect in order to establish our social networks based on proximity. So we wander through the group and when we find a monkey, we uh, say what it's doing and how close the other monkeys are to that individual. We collect ad lib data on innovations and on rare but important behaviors. But most of our data come from focal follows in which we can collect data both continuously and using instantaneous scans. So in the instantaneous scans, we collect the same kinds of things we do in the group scans, the activity and the proximity to others and how close they are to each other monkey within 10 body lengths. In terms of continuous data collection, we record all social behavior, so all gestures, facial expressions, approaches, leaves, vocalizations, all kinds of object handling, so what objects they're touching and what they're doing to those objects. So that includes foraging. Also self-directed behaviors. And just to give you a tiny feel for how this works in the field, this is just a few minutes of data collection. We do the typing either in the old, the good old days on these scions, which I loved, and now, nowadays on these uh, Android phones. And then, like I said, we fill in the fast action by recording things that are, are um, like fights and, and playbouts on these recorders and transcribe later. So um, let me just point to some of these. Um, let's see, can you see with the cursor? The first letter, so, so this last column here is what we're actually typing in the field. It gets automatically time stamped to the second whenever we hit enter for a line. And then we manually add a tag for who is the, the typist and who is the spotter. And this goes in the database and links to all of these people's inter-observer reliability records so that we know for each line, what kinds of things we can trust uh, the data for. So in this last column here, the first letter of our coding scheme tells us what kind of data it is and hence what syntax to use in parsing the data to throw it into the database tables. So lines that start with C are comments and those are just plain old English or Spanish. A line starting with P would be a group scan. For example, this line here, PCE, that means group scan of the monkey named Celeste, is engaging in the activity YFT, that forage travel. And the only animals in, in proximity to her are this monkey KY, Calypso, who is within five to 10 body lengths of her. Let's go down to this yellow zone, which is a focal follow. F colon YA means this is a focal follow of Yasuni and everything that follows is going to be about this monkey. So you'll have a point sample. Y F F B P means activity. He is foraging on fruit, bromeliad penguin species. X lines are about proximity. So this tells us he's in five to 10 body lengths of the monkey named Bilbo. H lines are object handling. So this would say H F B P three, handle fruit, bromeliad penguin species, three fruits in the cluster. And then you get a string of actions, bite, bite, ingest, 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 drop. Let's go down to social behaviors. Anything that starts with an F means that the focal animal is directing an activity to somebody else. So in this case, FAV, that's look at, he's looking at the monkey named Monster. And then he goes over and supplants her, GS, and takes her stick, which is SK. And we have self-directed behaviors. Here's a scratch. And I'll point out one other line before moving on. AF space, that means 
a monkey has started foraging within five body lengths of the focal. And that monkey is C.A. Cassie. And the behavior is that he is ingesting fruit, bromeliad penguin. And then we record whether the focal monkey looks at that or ignores that. So this is an important source of information for establishing the context for learning and what kinds of uh, learning opportunities they avail themselves of. So this is a, a great system, but it's not easy to learn and that's the drawback. So it takes us about three months of dawn to dust training to get people to use the system accurately enough, um, which is why we can't just take summer interns. We need people to stay, stay a year. So we train them with regard to all of these things on this list and I'll talk about the ones in red today. Coding, obviously that coding scheme is pretty, pretty sticky, especially the syntax. And there are a lot of there's several hundred, I think 600 and some codes to memorize to use it. So we need to have 100% accuracy on that. And we give them, uh, once they pass that initially, we continue to give them monthly exams to make sure they're not forgetting things. And then they have to use it quickly because capuchins move quickly. And so we have lots of um, recordings that they can practice their typing on. And once they get to the point where they are recording at 97% accuracy and none of that 3% that they're getting wrong is really important stuff uh, like sex or aggression or, or uh, play or something like that, then we um, can start using their data. Well, there's one more step, which is shadow follow. So it's easier to speed type when you're sitting in a chair at home. It's much harder when you're climbing cliffs and fording rivers. So the final step before we start using their data is that we have the trainees follow trained spotter typist teams. And again, we need to have 97% accuracy with none of that 3% being important stuff before we start uh, using them as, as a data collectors. Vocalization recognition is particularly hard. Humans seem to be much worse at, at uh, identifying acoustic uh, kinds of signals than they are at visual kinds of recognition. And so, uh, we do have monthly exams for that and we keep records of what kinds of mistakes each person routinely makes so that we know whose data we can use for particular calls. Okay, so most of what we know about innovation comes from experiments in which an individual is given a task, a task such as a puzzle box with a food reward, which is sufficiently novel that they would never have encountered it before. And they're scored as having innovated if they solve this task. This approach has many merits, but it prevents us from documenting the natural variation produced by innovators who are trying to engage in adaptive problem solving in their natural environments. And therefore it puts blinders on the researcher with regard to documenting the full range of creativity of these animals across multiple behavioral domains. And I'm really interested in these questions of what features of individuals make them more likely to innovate and how often these innovations prove beneficial. Um, so I've had to devise my own approach. Really the only other approach widely used for field studies is this post hoc analysis of field notes. You're probably all familiar with the chimp culture project, for example. So in that case, the data are collected for a variety of other purposes over the years. And then after these data have been collected, they try to use them for studying innovation and social transmission. And um, there are all kinds of biases that could creep in with that method. So here I present an alternative approach, which is also imperfect in many ways and dreadfully labor intensive, but which corrects some of these other methodological failures. So I published this article in collaboration with two of my former PhD students, Brendan Barrett and Irene Godoy. And the data and code for this work are available online at the link here, which is in the publication if you're curious about the stats. So I'll talk about the other aspects of the methods here. Uh, so the innovation literature, just like the social learning literature is full of, of definitional quagmires. Um, the word innovation is used in multiple ways by scholars in this field, but the way I'll use it in this talk is that an innovation is a new or modified learned behavior not previously found in a group or population. It is explicitly not a behavior that predictably emerges in all population members in certain phases of life or in particular ecological circumstances. And we do not require it to subsequently spread to others in order to call it an innovation. So this slide shows the characteristics of the data set used for this project and the way in which we operationalized innovation. So this is, uh, I, I used the data from 1990 to 2011, but I used different portions of that data set 
in different ways. So the first 11 years, the first 6,000 hours of data were used to determine what behaviors were species typical and for me to establish a really reliable coding scheme for all of the species typical behaviors, which we used uh, consistently throughout the other decades. And then the data set that I'm using to, um, for the stats in this paper to calculate innovation rates and figure out who is innovating the most is this uh, chunk of data from 2007 to 2011, which was 35,196 hours of data. And then there's this buffer period, which is the five years before that, which has 37,514 hours of data. So this buffer period is used to ensure that the behaviors reported in this orange period were really new in individual and group repertoires. So these data in these two chunks were collected by a team of 50 research assistants. And they were explicitly told to make comments about anything that was new that they hadn't seen before. Now, obviously what's new to them is not necessarily new to me or to the monkeys. So I, uh, and I've had 14,000 hours of data collection experience by that time. I went through and checked all of that against the behavior in, in these other periods to make sure they were really new. So we had in this study 10 social groups and 234 individual monkeys. So to qualify as an innovation in our data set in this orange period, this behavior could not have been seen in all groups. Otherwise we assume this is something that could naturally occur to any capuchin monkey. It had to be seen for the first time in the putative innovators group during this orange period. And it cannot have been seen during that innovators lifetime in the buffer period in the innovators social group. So uh, how often do these monkeys innovate? Um, in this innovation period, uh, the orange period, we found that there were 187 innovations, 127 of which were unique behaviors. So some of those may have been independently invented in multiple places. If that five year buffer period had been eliminated, we would have scored 263 behaviors. And if the study had been the length of a typical dissertation study, like a year, then we would have had 282 innovations. So that's sort of an obvious point, but I think it's always good to drive home the importance of long-term field studies for increasing accuracy. So a short study is drastically going to overestimate innovation rates. Another interesting question is whether these new behaviors are likely to remain in individual and group repertoires. So I found that only 20% of the new behaviors were then repeated by the innovator as far as we can tell. Obviously we're not watching them all the time, but they certainly didn't become reliable parts of these individual repertoires. And 22% of the new behaviors were observed in group mates subsequently. Some of that may be independent in invention and other, uh, other times it may be socially learning, social learning. Okay, so what kinds of innovations were produced? So I um, was looking in all behavioral domains with the exception that I didn't look at food choice or vocal repertoires because I didn't think our inner observer reliability was good enough to, to get that. But for any other thing in the repertoire, uh, we were scoring innovations. So um, the foraging uh, domain yielded 13% of all of those innovations we saw. Here's just a couple of examples. This monkey's found that if she sticks her butt into a tree hole far enough, she can access water with her tail tip that her arms and legs can't reach. Um, here is an uh, automeris caterpillar. I don't know if you've been stung by those, but oof, they hurt. These urticating hairs are just really painful. Some monkeys learn that they can wrap them in leaves or use a stick as a rolling pin to get those off. So anyway, this category is about techniques for drinking water or processing food. Um, investigative behaviors, so broadly exploratory behaviors made up 42% of the innovation repertoire. So these are mainly uh, locomotor innovations, so novel ways of moving through the environment. There are a lot of novel manipulations of other species, for example, grooming porcupines, uh, messing around with human artifacts and other inanimate objects. Here you see a youngster has figured out how to use a dried up cow pie as a, a seesaw is kind of fun. And 7% were self-directed behaviors, things like self-soothing, comfort, self-stimulation, for example, new ways to masturbate or new ways to engage in dental hygiene. And many monkeys develop personal quirks that involve holding or poking some particular part of their body for long periods of time. Then these habits persist for years and they can also be transmitted to close associates. 
And then my favorite category is a social category. Capuchins have become sort of famous for um, the kinds of strange new social interactions that they, they dream up. So um, a lot of dyadic bond testing rituals, Eduardo mentioned eyeball poking, so don't watch if you're squeamish. Things like taking your friend's finger and sticking it deep into your eye socket, um, or these males up in the right-hand corner are uh, sucking on one another's ears, there's some hand sniffing. Lots of creative time, kinds of social play are new ways to engage in aggressive displays or creative regulation of infant behavior. So um, who innovates and how often? Um, we found that about half of the monkeys in our sample innovated at least one time. And we found no sex or dominance rank differences in innovative tendencies. On average, individuals innovate in any one category less than once per year, so. There was an effect of age on innovation rate. So with the exception of the social interaction domain, we found that younger individuals were more prone to innovation. And this was particularly true with regard to, um, with, with this investigative, um, here. If you look at this graph, the orange one, investigative. So we, we calculated innovation rates differently for our, separately for all of these different domains. Um, this discovery runs counter to much of the literature, which generally shows that adults are better problem solvers. However, I would note that what we're documenting here um, by looking at entire behavioral repertoires rather than having a more task focused approach is not problem solving per se, which is the more common view of, of what innovation is, but creativity and exploratory behavior. It's theoretically predicted that in a species like capuchins in which there are huge brains and long lives and long juvenile periods, the juvenile period is a time for protect, protected learning and exploration. So the only uh, domain where there was, uh, where the older individuals were slightly more likely to innovate is in this social domain. We also looked at the effects of sociality on innovation rate and not surprisingly, more social in individuals invented more ways of socially interacting. Aside from that, it was the less social individuals who had slightly higher innovation rates in these other domains. So much of what we have seen in this um, innovation data set was just looks like messing around with no apparent goal. And most of these new behaviors look just plain silly and useless. Sometimes, however, a seemingly pointless behavior, even if it's neutral or risky, becomes useful when used in a particular context, even if the um, pairing between the behavior and the context was accidental originally. If the match between behavior and useful function is perceived and the behavior is repeatedly paired with that context, an adaptive tradition can occur. We saw this particularly clearly in the social domain. So behaviors that seem like a bad idea, such as poking yourself in the eye with your friend's finger, can take on a useful function when incorporated into the behavioral repertoire as part of a bond testing ritual. So I'd like to tell you a few results from a recent paper published, co-published with Marco Smola in a special issue of Filtrans about the evolutionary origins of ritual in which we analyze innovations adopted as traditions in the social domain and test hypotheses about po possible functions. So for this paper, we looked at just one social group, Flake's group on us in Hacienda Palom and we looked at the period from 2004, which is when they first visioned off from Abbey's, to 2018, using 9,260 hours of observational data, which included 446 of these social rituals. We established social networks via group scans, these spatial associations, and we looked at relationship quality via an index using data from focal follows and ad libitum data. And we calculated coalition rates via ad libitum data. And these data were analyzed via maximum likelihood population effects, mixed effects models. So we tested three hypotheses and I'll show you the raw data supporting these in the next slide. Uh, the first hypothesis was that these rituals serve to establish and maintain social bonds. If that's true, you'd expect more frequent performance in dyads who spend more time in proximity, have higher relationship quality, and have more frequent cooperation and coalitionary aggression. This last prediction was supported. The middle one kind of was, but the first one definitely was not. 
Second hypothesis is that rituals are Zahavian tests of social bonds. And if that's true, then rituals should involve some kind of risk or discomfort, which they definitely did. So like sticking the finger in your eye socket or putting your fingers in somebody else's jaws where they could be bitten off um, are, are examples of, of these kinds of risk and discomfort, which pervade most of these rituals. Rituals should be most frequent when the state of the relationship is unclear. So in dyads that have less frequent communication about where they stand or in dyads uh, in this third uh, prediction that have comfortable but not completely stable relationships is when you'd have the most rituals. So you need to test when you have some ambiguity in what's gonna happen whenever you get together. And then, uh, so all of these were supported by the data. And then the third hypothesis is that you will have more rituals when, um, if participation is, no, I'm sorry, you will participate in rituals in order to promote group-wide solidarity. So this is coming more from sociology, Durkheim and people like that. And if that were the case, then you would expect simultaneous performance by many individuals, and they would be using a pretty consistent form in the ritual. And that's definitely not the case. So each dyad has their own um, special ritual and they share elements with other members of their social network, but it's their own pretty unique ritual. And they perform these in partial isolation from the rest of the group. So here are the data, the raw data. So on the y-axis for all of these graphs is the rate of ritual performance. Each dot in this, each data point is a dyad. And on the left, we have the proximity index. A one means that they spend all their time together. A zero means they spend no time together. And you can see that most of the data points are, that are, are high for ritual rate are falling in this and where they don't spend a lot of time together. That is, they don't have a lot of recent information on what's likely to happen, where, where this, how this relationship um, stands. The middle graph shows relationship quality index varying from zero, which is a terrible relationship. Whenever you get together, something terrible happens like aggression or, or um, avoidance or something like that. Or a one, which means that everything that happens when you get together is nice, like grooming or play. And this graph is a little problematic in that there's a big pileup of data points down here where you, you can't tell how, how many data points are contributing. So take my word for the fact that between 0.7 and 0.9 is where you're getting most of the high values for ritual rate. So that's a pretty comfortable relationship but with a bit of ambiguity left in it. And then a third of all data points are falling over here um, between 0.9 and one and hardly any of those so that's an extremely comfortable relationship, but hardly any of those have high ritual performance rates. And then there was a moderate association between coalition formation and rate of ritual performance. Okay, so how do learning strategies vary according to the characteristics of individuals? One way that long-term field sites have made important contributions is via longitudinal studies that document the acquisition of traits in the context of age-related changes in cognitive abilities, motor skills, strength, and shifts in exposure to conspecific models from whom they could learn. Primatologists such as Ann Russell have highlighted the fact that social learning strategies of primates orchestrate these changes in cognitive, motor, and social development. For example, foraging techniques that are effective for an adult may not work for a younger individual who lacks the strength or coordination to employ a technique that is efficient for an adult. So during his juvenile phase, an individual may benefit from watching juveniles who are only slightly older than him. However, when he's an adult, he will benefit more from observing older individuals who are a closer match to his current cognitive and physical abilities. The kinds of information that individuals need exposure to will change over the course of their lives and will necessitate shifts in both the balance of asocial versus social information gathered and also the kinds of models that they will most benefit from watching during social learning. There will be certain phases of the life history when the animals are most capable of benefiting from certain kinds of inputs, and this will vary from species to species. Whereas tightly controlled experiments in a lab can elucidate some aspects of social learning processes way better than field conditions can, the inherent complexity of the naturalistic setting can tell us important things that captive experiments, as they're typically carried out, do not. In the wild, animals have more freedom to distribute themselves across the landscape and are active agents in their exploration of the world and in their choice of which group members to observe and copy. As we watch learners in action, we're quite keenly aware that there's variation in the amount of access each learner has to particular kinds of resources and learning opportunities. 
and that the time scale over which learning occurs varies from one individual to, the, to another. Individuals vary according to their motivations to try new things, their social rank, their age, and their quality of their relationships with various models. With the aim of understanding and answering some of these questions in the previous slide, we divide special protocols for studying extractive processing of certain foods that seemed likely to be a rich source of information about learning processes. Then we documented over a period of several years, the processing techniques used by these monkeys, the social context of the processing, and who was observing whose techniques. Capuchins reside in large social groups where they have many sources of social information with access to multiple models from all age sex classes. This social complexity creates many methodological difficulties in isolating the source of primary social influence, but it also offers opportunities to test different models. So I'm just gonna talk about two of, of these extractive foraging challenges today. Mujea Candida, which is kind of a natural equivalent of the two action test, because in order to get these wind dispersed seeds out of these cracks, they either pound the fruits or they scrub them. And these turn out to be equally efficient techniques that all monkeys in our sample discover. This Panama fruit is a quite different task. So opening these capsules is extraordinarily difficult. It requires five different processing steps, at least strength, dexterity, skill, and processing times, depending on what technique they use and how old and experienced they are, varies from one second to well over an hour to never really. And they employ a lot of different techniques. So this is a case where social learning can save monkeys a lot of time. It's also a case where different techniques may be optimal for monkeys of different sizes and strengths. Collecting sufficient data on this particular food item necessitated a quasi-experimental approach focused on a single group. So I'll tell you about the Luhea first. Um, this graph shows how the behavioral repertoire for processing Luhea fruits changes with age. Each data point here is the number of different techniques applied during processing of the first 10 fruits that they encountered during that year of life. So each data point is an individual at a particular age. Consistent with findings from humans, younger monkeys try out a wider range of techniques when they're solving an extractive foraging challenge. So by the time they reach adulthood, they have stopped using techniques that are less efficient and they generally just use one technique, either pounding or scrubbing and occasionally sample the other one. In this next slide, I take a different approach, looking only at the two most common and effective techniques, the pounding and the scrubbing. And the point of this study is to assess the role of social influence in the development of extractive foraging techniques. So each graph represents a year of life and each data point is an individual monkey. You can think of the X axis as the monkey C axis and the Y axis as the monkey do axis. So what you have here on each axis is the proportion of their processing attempts that was pounding as opposed to scrubbing. And so um, you can see the relationship between what they saw and what they did. During the first year of life, only four of our 48 subjects, um, so 21 of which were female and 27 of which were male, actually engaged in processing as, as opposed to just nibbling those easy to access seeds. In the second year, everybody was already attempting to process and um, there is a pretty tight correspondence between what they saw and what they did, except for a few orphans who were developmentally weird. And then as the years progress, you see that there's sort of a pulling away from this diagonal and they become by year five, either a pounder or a scrubber. And um, by year five, they've adopted the technique that they will prefer throughout adulthood. This graph shows the percent change in practice technique for every unit of change in technique observed, which is based on the outcome of a Poisson regression model with standard error adjusted for within subject correlation. So this graph combines the influence of observation of the mother with observation of non-mothers. Though if you separate those two sources of influence, you get essentially the same pattern. You can see here that the role of social influence has the greatest impact in year two. So this is year of development along the x-axis. Um, and you can also see that males, the lower line, were less influenced by what they saw than females were, despite the fact that males and females had equal opportunity to see what others were doing and both paid the same amount of attention to the models near them. 
Um, now it's sort of puzzling that there is any social influence when you consider that pounding and scrubbing are techniques really easy to figure out on your own and that there's no inherent advantage to doing one or the other. Uh, as Franz Duval points out, monkeys often gain an intrinsic reward by copying others with whom they feel a, a close uh, bond, even in the absence of practical value to adopting the behavior. So I'm guessing here that uh, because the females are the philopatric sex and they form lifelong bonds with their, their group mates, whereas males disperse, females felt more motivated to copy what their group mates were doing. It just may have made them feel better. Now I'll turn to the other foraging tasks, the Panama, and recall that these are much harder to open and they generate a lot of close observation from others and have this wide range of efficiency of techniques unlike the previous fruit, the Luhea. So they seem likely to result in different learning strategies than what was employed for the Luhea and, and indeed that was the case. So this paper uh, was part of Brendan Barrett's PhD thesis, which was, and it was co-supervised by me and Richard McElrath. And it involves a more experimental approach and also a new modeling approach. Uh, this experience weighted attraction modeling approach, which allows us to accomplish all of the following in the same model. Estimate unique predictions of individual and social learning for each individual. Utilize dynamic social network data. Include more than two behavioral options. Evaluate multiple social learning strategies. And relate individual characteristics to learning strategies. So this experiment was done on Flake's group, which is a fission product of Abby's group. And this is interesting because Flake's group, when they fissioned, moved from an area that had Panama trees in its home range to an area that did not. They moved to this oak forest and pasture and riverine forest area, did not have any Panama trees. And so this was an ideal opportunity to document how inexperienced individuals acquire and develop a natural behavior in the wild when exposed to multiple knowledgeable tutors with different behaviors. Basically, Brendan had to climb trees, outside the range, collect some Panama fruits, and then dole them out two at a time so that we could monitor every single access that they had to this task and see what they did. And just because it's hard for people to visualize this, I'll show a quick video. Basically, Brendan would had hide the fruit under his poncho, stand up when they weren't looking, and then they would find the fruit and carry it, and we would be able to record everything they did using a combination of video and narration and dictaphone. Um, and so they did a lot of stupid stuff in addition to the sensible things. And we monitored everyone who watched. And we also monitored um, what the fruits looked like after they had been ravaged by capuchin monkeys. So we used these experience weighted attraction models to analyze the data. And these enabled us to include, like I said, the indi individual and social learning in the same modeling approach and to compare the multiple social learning strategies. So these are the different models tested. We used eight different models. One was looking just at frequency dependent learning. So like linear copying, conformity or anti-conformity. The second model looked at payoff bias. So seeking to see whether they copy the most profitable technique. Third model, matrilineal kin bias. Fourth model, looking to see whether they copied the alpha male or female preferentially. Fifth model is age cohort bias. So do they copy members of the same age cohort? Sixth model is whether they copy older individuals. The seventh model combined frequency dependence and payoff bias. And then the eighth model was a global model which included the first six uh, approaches in a single model. And this global model was the best fit model. It had 94% of the, the weight. So here are the details of the global model. Uh, overall, payoff bias and negative frequency dependence were the best supported strategies. And you can see here that negative frequency dependence was less than one, showing that they are interested in new and rare things. Of the content and model biases within these blue brackets here, uh, the closer to zero that something gets, the less important it is. So within this set, we see that the, we have the best support for payoff bias but we also get some noteworthy contribution for age bias and a little bit of support for age cohort bias. The age, uh, age bias is unsurprising as older monkeys typically show the best payoff behaviors, but the cohort bias might be important because techniques available to one individual are related to age. So if you're a juvenile, 
it may be wise to copy those who are similar to you because you don't have that jaw strength to do what the most efficient adults are doing anyway. It seems likely that social learning is guiding exploration of the behavior, whereas individual learning is reinforcing what techniques they settle on. So these graphs demonstrate the changes in frequency of the techniques used over time. So each color is a different technique for opening the Panama fruits. The raw data are in the graph on the left here and the model predictions in the graph on the right. The most efficient technique was employed by a peripheral subordinate male who normally didn't get any respect, but they gradually realized he had the most efficient technique and that took off. So that it became the most common technique in the population eventually. What this graph shows is that older capuchin monkeys are more likely to stick with their old habits, even when they find something that might be a little better, rather than incorporating new information, whereas younger capuchins are more likely to incorporate new information into their repertoire. And this graph shows that younger capuchins relative to older capuchins pay more attention to social information. Thus far, I hope I've made it clear that this type of learning strategy employed depends very much on the behavioral domain or the type of challenge being addressed and also on the characteristics of the individual. So you saw very different learning strategies applied to the Luhea and the Panama foraging tasks. But I also did wanna do some more broad strokes analysis as well. And what this graph shows is age-related changes in visual attention paid to others foraging efforts in general. So if you think back to that method slide where I have um, a focal animal and an, then another animal comes in and forages in five body lengths and I see whether they look at what they're doing, that is the data set used to generate this graph. So um, we can see here on the x-axis where we have the focal age and then we have these different lines showing model predictions for uh, foragers of different ages. So this is forager age one year and this top one is foragers age 20 years, for example. So you can see in this graph that the younger the forager is, the more likely they are to observe what others are doing, regardless of age, but also, whoops, but also they uh, preferentially watch the older ones. When they have a choice between older and younger individuals, they preferentially watch the older, wiser monkeys. So if knowledge and propensity to learn from others change with age, then this will affect cultural dynamics. Age structure affects number of innovators, number of knowledgeable models available for naive individuals to learn from, and the strength of direction of edges in a learning network. Although we've been collecting data relevant to these questions for three decades now, it's only recently as we reach the sixth generation mark that I feel like we've had enough data to fruitfully analyze these patterns in collaboration with modelers. So I've established a working group comprised of both modelers and field researchers interested in cultural evolution so that we can investigate how population dynamics affect rates of innovation, transmission, and extinction of behavioral variants and compare our data with predictions from models of how these processes are believed to work. Although we're particularly interested in age composition right now, we also want to look at how social networks based on kinship structure, various aspects of relationship quality, and distribution of personality traits affect those processes. A study as long as this has so many people to thank that I could easily spend an entire hour thanking people, but I, that would be boring for you. So I do wanna just thank a few people, the, uh, Irene, Lara, and Linda who did the genetic work, which is so critical. Uh, Don Cohen, who helps us with the database. Two long-term field site managers who stayed many years and made my life so much better, Hannah and Deepka. And 152 field assistants who have contributed significantly to the, generating these data sets also the Costa Rican Park Service and the private landowners who let us work on their land and my primary funding sources. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Susan. A wonderful, very interesting talk. I'm sure there will be lots and lots of questions. Be before we before we start with our question and answer session, for those of you who may be new to the to the series, just very a, a few quick announcements. Uh, starting next week, we will meet at 1100 hours, New York. But for those of you east of the United States or in Europe, it's gonna be 1600 hours Paris because we change time here in the US. And next week, uh, we encourage you to check the, the announcement. We're gonna have a, let me show you quickly. We have a kind of different presentation next week. It's gonna be 
the, the findings, the results of a workshop, a working group we had for a couple of months, initiated and led by Lauren Heiss. We've been working on how we can use remote seminars to teach animal behavior. So if you're interested in bringing your research, everyone's research to the classroom, I think you'll really enjoy next week's presentation. And I very much encourage you to let your colleagues who may not be joining the seminar because of their interest in social evolution per se, but may appreciate learning how they can bring ideas about animal behavior into other types of, of teaching contexts. Uh, with that, we want to move on to the question and answer session. Uh, it's going to last until 1 p.m. Uh, then we need to give our invited speaker a little bit of a break and rest before she goes on to having individual meetings with the members of our labs. Uh, I want to remind you that, uh, Susan, I need you to, okay, you have stopped sharing, good. Uh, for taking questions, what we're going to do is we ask people, and some of you are already doing it, uh, you just type a question mark in the chatting window, send to everyone, not just to me, and we will go in order, taking, I will be in order taking your questions. Uh, we ask that you please uh, say your name and very, very briefly where you are so that we slowly get to know each other well as we continue with the fine seminar series. So I think that's all uh, I have before we can start uh, sharing our thoughts and questions with Susan. And let me go. I mean, I, I there's a whole, oh my goodness, we're gonna have lots of questions. If I wanna be sure that I don't miss any question marks coming up early. The first question we have is from Leticia Aviles. Leticia, please uh, unmute yourself and take it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Susan. That was fascinating, super interesting work. And uh, so I have one practical question and then one general question. The general question is, over the time that these monkeys have been observed, do you guys get a sense that there is some progress in terms of how they are able to manage foraging and whatever other things they, they need to do in their environment? Or they, are they just mostly just keeping up with a changing environment and there is no progress in a sense with the innovation that they're making? So that is the general question. And then the practical question, I'm just curious for the, when you use the Android phone to document behaviors, is there a particular app that you use for that? Yeah, so the second one is easy. Uh, we've developed, or Brendan developed a, a app called um, Ethology, I think, and it's available on his GitHub site. You can download it. So it's a very simple app. Uh, really, all it does is timestamp what you type in there, and then you can do what you will with it afterwards. So you can then download it as a, a CSV file or an Excel file. So um, yeah, look at, at Brendan Barrett's GitHub uh, site, and you can you can use that. It's it's really easy to use. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of progress, so of course, within individual lifespans, there's progress. Uh, you, you see them um, perfecting these, these skills that they learn from others. Um, I haven't seen any tremendous, I mean, we haven't had any big shakeups, environmental shakeups, right? Um, aside from an El Nino drought in 2014, 15, we did see um, adoption of, of a, a couple of new food sources in there that spread pretty quickly. I guess that would be some, some quick cultural adaptation probably. Um, but I haven't seen like an emergence of an incredible technology over the past 30 years or anything like that, if that's what you mean. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, we will take eventually questions. Those of you watching the presentation via YouTube, please also feel free to ask questions. Uh, one of us will bring them to to the chatting window and we can take those questions as well. Uh, Claudia Fichtel, your question is next. Yeah, hi, I'm Claudia Fichtel, the German Primate Center. Hi, Susan. Hi. Thanks, it was a great talk. Um, I was puzzled about the occurrence of the social conventions. You could show that it's not related to proximity, but through the quality of the relationships. But I would assume that individuals um, which have a good um, relationship spend also more time in proximity. How can you explain that? Mm -hmm. um, you know, I haven't really graphed to see how, how that works. I mean, sometimes they do, right? Um, 
So I, I guess I had to do a kind of analysis that would help me look. Wait, what did I? I'd have to look through my notes. I remember trying to, to look at various axes and, and compartmentalize uh, dyads that had you know, high scores on this and low scores on that. And I, I, my memory is not good enough to recall um, whether there were, was something weird about the ones that spent less time together but had high uh, quality relationships. Um, so I'd probably have to dig into the, the raw data again to, to answer that question in, in a really good way. Uh, but you can uh, sometimes have individuals who don't spend a lot of time together but have perfectly amiable relationships when they do come together. It, it does happen. Um, and I think that's, okay. that's how we get the pattern that, that you saw. Oh. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. The next question is from Uta Radispio. Hi, Susan. My name is Uta Radispio from the Institute of Zoology. Uh, wonderful talk, thank you. I have a question uh, regarding um, the useful innovations, so some that are really functional, making your life easier. So uh, you mentioned this one individual that was a very low ranking male, then this innovation sped off at some point. So in this case where there's is something really beneficial, do you think there are social benefits for those animals that are innovative and that come up with a good solution? Can that kind of put some benefit on this animal? We were really hoping it would, but we didn't see any evidence of that. We're quite fond of little Napoleon. He's a total misnomer. His personality doesn't fit his name at all. Um, but no, we didn't see that his life necessarily improved much as a consequence of doing that, I'm afraid. It's not a just world. <laughs> Thank you, Ute. The next question is from Maria Creighton. Hi, uh, I'm Maria. I'm a grad student in the Department of Biology at McGill. Um, and you talked about the factors that influence how likely individuals are to innovate. And I was wondering if we know whether ecological factors like ecological necessity influence individuals' probability to innovate um, and the likelihood of subsequent social transmission. So for example, for forging innovations, if the lack of food resources might be associated with individuals likely to adopt new forging behaviors and socially transmit them. Mm -hmm. I suspect that that's true. Um, that wasn't something I analyzed in that paper, partly because we had pretty poor inter-observer reliability for foods. So typically what happens when I've got all of these, I find that most of my, my RAs are really into monkeys and they really don't care about plants that much. I like plants and monkeys, but you know, I suspect that what happens is that they only ask me, what is this plant? When it's, they've seen it about, you know, about the 20th time they've seen it, they start to think, whoa, maybe I should find out what this is. And so with that kind of um, problem, I can't really say who, who started, who, you know, who forged in this plant first. Um, anecdotally for my own observations, I think that is going on. I did notice them, um, trying more new foods uh, during this El Nino drought and uh, relying more on things that they don't normally pay much attention to. So, um, but I don't have a nice statistical data set that I can uh, present you with to, to prove that. It's, it's more intuition. Thank you. Thank you. We sometimes fall behind with questions that are coming from the YouTube audience. So I, I see that there, there are some already. Alexa, if you have the first one, do you want to go? with some of our colleagues watching us through YouTube, please. Um, sure, actually there aren't any YouTube questions yet, okay. um, but I can ask a question. And uh, Susan, you already know me, but for everyone else, I'm Alexa and I'm a PhD student at Yale, but I was also a research assistant with Susan. Um, I was wondering if you could talk about, when you were talking about uh, what we would expect for rituals and who is testing social bonds. You were talking about how we would expect more tests for relationships that have somewhat ambiguous relationships. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about expectations that we would have for relationships that are maybe of higher importance versus lower importance. Like even if you have an ambiguous relationship, but it's maybe with like a very edgy monkey who you don't really have much social context with, would that be an individual that you would, you know, expect to see social bond testing with? I mean, I think theoretically, yes. If you're just following Sahadi's logic, you, you would expect that they would do this more with the important relationships. I'm not really sure whether that falls out of the data set. Um, 
I, I guess I didn't have a variable that was important. I mean, how would we could test it though? I mean, what do you think would be a good way of operationalizing important? I mean, yeah, I mean, I would think it's important. There's like rank would be one, but then um, we'll think about Napoleon. So, um, <laughs> so <laughs> Napoleon. Um, one thing that really stood out is that he had really low proximity of everybody, but he had a lot of different um, edges in the social network based just on ritual performance. Um, I doubt that very many other monkeys thought he was important, but he probably thought those relationships were important. So it gets really complicated and I couldn't quite work out a way to, to do that. But, um, but if you think of a, a good way to, to do it, let me know and we can, uh, we can check. Yeah, I wonder if like any individuals try to initiate some ritualistic bond testing and then they're denied. And that could potentially indicate like, yes, I, I view this relationship as important, even if maybe the other one doesn't and then they deny you or or something, but yeah, I'll think on it. Yeah, you don't see that very often though this past field season, I did see a couple of real cold refusals to engage in this. So it happened when, uh, so one of the most puzzling things is that minstrel and mead, you remember are very tight in flakes group. And then we've had this fission and the sisters have been separated and they can't do their daily hand sniffing anymore. And um, so minstrel is, seems to have fallen in rank. Now, uh, now she has this fission product, which is her own match line, minus mead. And um, she's trying to hand sniff with these other monkeys who really don't want to do it. And they're, they're very adamant that they don't want to do it. Um, but we don't have very many refusals in the data set. So if I keep an eye on that group, we may get a bigger sample that would enable us to answer questions like that. Thanks. Mm -hmm. The next question comes from Kaya Tombak. Hi there, I'm Kaya. I'm a postdoc at Hunter College, CUNY. Thanks for the talk. Um, I was just wondering if some groups um, innovate more than others and if they do, if you see any association with group size or age sex composition or anything like that? Um, let's see. I don't think there was any dramatic difference. I have to look back at our paper. I think we did look at group size, though I don't remember anything particularly striking coming out. There are some groups that have more social innovation, like this flakes group. The reason I picked them for that study is that they did have a pretty high rate of innovation or at least maintenance of, of those innovations as, as traditions. Um, and then we haven't done a whole lot with the social network properties yet. So I'm, I'm trying to muster um, enthusiasm and some of my modeling colleagues to do more work along those lines in this innovation working group I, I mentioned. I think it may be my turn. So at the beginning, um, at the beginning of the presentation, you described the fission that, that quite a few groups have gone through. And I am, I, I am aware that the same has been reported for the Capuchins in Iguazu National Park in Northern Argentina. I don't know if the same has been reported for some of the Capuchins being studied in Santa Rosa. So I wanted, I, I wanted to ask you first if, if you if you're under the impression that these fissions are something common in all kinds of capuchin populations that people have studied. And then what do you make? So we're detecting these fission events because we're studying them long enough. So I wonder these kind of situations, if it were the case that they only come up because we study them long enough, what kind of consideration should we have as we ponder socio-ecological approaches to describing group size? Because if I, I mean, I could randomly take a couple of years, which is the average length of most primate field studies, random sample from your data set, and I would end up with very, very, very different stories relating group size to socioecology. And that would only be because I haven't been long there enough and understanding that groups are gonna grow to apparently somewhat like 30 and then fissioning. So, so can you comment on that? You know, Charlie Jansen did a really nice paper in uh, that Watson Kepler volume, the long-term field study volume, where he talked about the life cycle of groups and um, you know, how, you know, how these visions happen and, and how infanticides happen. And you, you have all of these um, sort of recurring dynamics that happen. And, and so it really doesn't matter when in the life cycle you look at that group. Um, and I think that's true at Lomas too, we see very similar things. So for example, 
fissions are generally triggered by one of two things. Either the group gets so big that coordination during foraging is hard or the feeding competition becomes really intense. Or sometimes a group of migrants comes in and there, there's fear of infanticide and some females will flee and try to get away from that. And it doesn't usually work. Usually some different bad males come and find them and kill their babies. But, um, but that is a precipitating uh, event for fissions. What's happening in Santa Rosa? Are they seeing them as well? I think so. I haven't seen any any reporting of that, but um, I, I imagine it does. But yeah, the, the only published data that I've seen on that are my site and Charlie Jansen's um, Appella, well, Eugenius now, but. Um, Thank you. Iguazu site. David, David Wood, do you have a question yourself? You have a question from YouTube? I have a question myself, and there is a question on YouTube also potentially for afterwards. Um, I'm David, I'm a second year graduate student working with Eduardo at Yale, and I worked with Susan for a year at Lomas. Uh, and I'm very curious if you've looked at the distribution of innovations or like repeat innovations, I guess, if they perform the behavior more than one time across the year. And if you think maybe that could have some implications for the motivation to do these new behaviors, whether it's they, it's during the dry season, they have fewer food resources or need to learn how to make the most out of them. Or if it's during the wet season and there's tons of food and they're just kind of playing around and seeing new things that work. Uh, and also if they're socializing more or more social innovations during the wet season when there's plenty of food and it's not super hot or during the dry season when it's really hot. So they just spend a lot of their time hanging out by the river. No, we haven't done that yet. Actually, that would be fun to do. Um, so the, the appendix or the supplementary info has um, a little bit of information about what kinds of, of behaviors were repeated and in, in what groups, uh, but there isn't a temporal component there. Um, I should say also that, you know, our sampling density for some of these is, is pretty slim. So, you know, I, I'd have some, some doubts about you know, how reliable the, um, the inferences about gap between actual use of that behavior is given the, the holes in the observational data. So it might be a hard thing to, to answer. Uh, but I have had the impression over the years that the social innovations uh, or at least the, the performance of the traditions that have emerged from those innovations goes down a bit in the rainy season. Uh, probably they just have less time to sit around doing that kind of thing. They're too busy locomoting and foraging. Very interesting, thanks. David, why don't you go ahead and, and share the question that our colleagues from watching YouTube are bringing. Irene Godoy asks, do you have a sense for whether the social innovations increase after a fission, either in the main group or in the smaller product group? Oh, that's a good question. Um, I, I don't know. That, uh, Irene, remind me to look at that later. Uh, don't let me forget, that would be fun. I did think that um, Minstrel's group, which I saw right after the fission was doing an awful lot of that stuff, but um, I haven't really uh, obviously started to analyze those data. It's just coming in now. Thanks. Please, I really would encourage students. We've already heard from some of you, but this is really a forum where we'd like to hear from everyone. So don't, don't be shy. The first one is the toughest, but some of you have been joining us and asking questions all along and we wanna see more of that, yeah? We have now a question. Next question is from Karsten Schrading. Yes, hello, I'm Karsten Schrading from the CNRS in Strasbourg, France. Thanks for an amazing talk. It's really incredible what you observed. And to apologize for my question, maybe you answered it already repeatedly. And it's just all these tons of data are too amazing for me. You observed nearly 200 innovations within five years. And from what you said, I believe these five years were not special. So one can assume the five years before and afterwards the same rate that comes to something like 4,000 innovations within a, a decade. So other people ask before, what, what, what do you think is the function? Is the environment very variable? Or I mean, this huge amount of innovations also makes me think, is there any role of sexual selection or why is there so such a huge amount of, of innovations happening? I guess I'm not really sure whether this is a highly unusual number of innovations. The problem with the innovation literature is that we don't have consistent methodologies. So 
we really don't know. I mean, uh, there, there isn't a comparable data set yet for us to know whether this is an extraordinarily high or maybe even a slightly low rate of innovations. I think it is probably above average, but I don't know whether it's extraordinary necessarily. And if you look at the uh, appendix of what's invented, you know, it's not like all of these are amazing revolutionary things either. They're, they're just novel things. Um, so, um, so yeah, I'm not sure if it's, it, uh, if it's, um, if capuchins are all that special. Um, I'm guessing they're just a little bit special. Okay, thank you. I got distracted. I should be, it's, it's a challenge. To, I need to keep track of who's asking questions, but at the same time, so I sometimes get distracted thinking about the questions and the answers myself. So, uh, sorry, the next one, the next question comes from Adriana Alexandra. Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. right, right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Susan. Thanks for your nice talk. Hi. Um, I was wondering so, within the social bonding or the social context, you mentioned this test bonding innovations, right? And they were meant to, as you said, test the relationship between the individuals. So, I was wondering if after this innovation happens, if first, if, it, if they repeat it over time, and then once they stop doing it, does the relationship change the status? Like they become more reliant on each other or what's the function of them like in the long term? Oh, those are wonderful questions and they are in our queue of things to do. They're really hard to answer because uh, you really need to have long focal follows in order to get that. If you are using a data set that has holes in it, you don't know whether they had a fight or did something really nice or had another bond test in this gap, right? And so there, there was a graduate student who I, I really hope will finish um, writing up her work at some point who did two day long follows um, in order to, to try to answer these questions and also had cortisol samples throughout all, all of this time period. And so I was, I'm really hoping that someday she will um, finish that work. She took some time off from school and we're hoping she'll come back and, and finish it because that was a data set that was really designed to test exactly what you're asking. Um, but apart from that one data set, I don't feel like I can really answer the question because of the, the structure of the observational data. You know, we're, we're, we've got you know, 10 groups and, and many individuals and the sampling density is not dense enough to enable that a test of the question you just asked, aside from this one graduate student's chunk of data. I see, thank you. Maria Creighton, your turn again. Great. Hi, sorry, I have one more question. Oh, please. <laughs> um, but I wanted to double check one of the things you said. So I think that you said, maybe I interpreted it wrong, but less social individuals are more likely to observe non-social innovations, but they're less likely to observe social innovations. Is that right? Um, less likely to create those innovations. The, so, but for, for social, because you showed the four, I think four different um, types of innovation. Um, mm. And for the three that weren't social, it seemed like the less social were more likely to- To invent. Yeah, right. That's, that's right. So, Not to those, but to invent them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right, so do you think that this could reflect that being less social means that you're forced to rely more heavily on learning asocially or invention as opposed to social learning in contrast to more social individuals? I do think that that is a likely explanation, but I also can't rule out the possibility that they are just have more free time. You know, and throughout the literature, it's really hard to disentangle that free time hypothesis versus the need to learn hypothesis. Um, so this is something I've been thinking about a lot lately, and it is really extraordinarily difficult to tease all of that apart. Yes, I thought of that too when you showed that. Okay. Well, yeah. thank you. <laughs> hey, I'm going to skip myself. I can go later. Kaya, Kaya Tombak, you're up again. Um, I thought it was really interesting that there were no group group wide rituals uh, that took um, that were taken up, um, and it, it's especially interesting because these rituals, you know, involved risky or uncomfortable behaviors. And so in these dyadic interactions where, you know, if you're like poking someone's finger in your eye, it strikes me as odd that you would not try the same risky behavior with other dyads and that you would 
just you know uh, basically try to innovate um, all kinds of risky behaviors. So the trade-off seems high, and I wonder what your ideas are as to why they have. Is there some advantage to having a private, you know, test between dyads, or what, what's the point? Yeah, I think there is um, actually. I mean, obviously there are a lot of even Zahavi and Von testing um, behaviors that are stereotypical and in species typical. Um, repertoires, so like non-conceptive sex or something like that, or these gargles that Alexa is, is uh, um, working on. But um, I think that there, you know, there is an opportunity cost. It takes a long time to devise a dyadic ritual that's special to this, um, this dyad. And paying that cost is right there indicative of um, commitment to that, that relationship. And and so I think that in most of these things like eyeball poking, you know, if you just went up to a random monkey and did that, that would not be taken well. It would be really dangerous, right? So um, it's been interesting to watch these dyads slowly develop a ritual and sort of negotiate what elements are going to be in it, who's going to do what regularly. Um, and I think that the, that process really is critical to what makes it an important bond test. You know, you have to remember what you do with this individual and show that you care by, oh yeah, this is our thing. We we'll do this together. So, so essentially, it's hard to test, obviously, but. Mm -hmm. So essentially, if it became a group-wide ritual, it would kind of lose its function. It you might know? actually lose its function. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Uh, Leonor Crooks. Hi, um, I'm a second year student at the University of Derby and I don't know if I missed this because I was on quite a lot of data and I was trying to keep on top of it, but um, I find all the really long-term personality data really interesting and I was wondering if this was sort of used to infer the social network, so maybe those with similar characteristics performed more rituals or the younger, uh, the younger ones learned more from those with similar characteristics like followed those more. I know you said they followed, uh, females followed females more, but I was wondering maybe also similar characteristics. I just found the personality data. I mean, it's so long term, it was really interesting, but yeah, I was just wondering that, but I don't know if I missed it. No, I, that is our goal, um, but I've only published this two papers on the personality data so far, and um, I'm trying to enlist some some modelers to to help me with, with uh, the analysis of this. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine, well, so, so John Capitano's lab has done some really interesting work about social networks and personalities, um, not related to the kinds of issues I'm interested in. But um, yeah. I mean, I think there, there are some cases where having the same personality would make you more likely to learn effectively and other cases where there are complementary roles that would be more effective. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, there's a, there are a lot of things we could, we could ask using those data sets and we're just at the beginning of that stage of the research. Okay, I'll keep a look out. Thank you, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. Next question is from Sari Van Bell. Um, hi, Susan. I'm Sari Van Bell, a postdoc at the University of Texas in Austin. Um, I have a question about kind of the reverse. You're talking about the inventions and some of them stick and then see, do you see them go away, that they stop doing them, some of these new things and obviously the ones that were established right because i understand that some were only seen few times yeah um the main things that i notice that go extinct are these social rituals so it seems like most of them last about a decade and then they go out of style and that sort of makes sense if you think about what we believe this is a function that you know you um may do better to to make a new ritual um, and invest the time in, in making a new ritual. Uh, and that may show a little more of what you're, what you're trying to, to do. Um, but usually these go extinct when a, a member of that network that performs this, this behavioral element dies. Um, one thing that's interesting is that with regard to some of these things like the hand sniffing and eyeball poking, sometimes the network will fall apart that does these things. And then you'll still have members of that network who don't have the friends they used to do it with still poking themselves in the eye or sticking their finger up their own nose, almost as like it's nostalgia or something, remembering the good old days when they had someone to do this with. I mean, I'm just being anthropomorphic right now, but um, 
it is a bizarre thing that happens. It might, it might be telling us something about their psychology. I don't know. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alexa Dushino, you're next. Um, I have another question, and I'm sorry if I've already asked you this before, um, but I feel like the Panama is so hard to get out. Like most of the monkeys seem to really just give up before they open it. Um, I would guess that more Panama do not get cracked open than do. And it takes eons. So I was wondering if you know, like of the nutritional value of the Panama, like does it have really high protein? Is there some rare micronutrient? Like why? I would guess that they are expending more energy than they are gaining or at least they're sacrificing time to do many other tasks uh, to try to crack these open. No, I agree. It seems insane. For one thing, the seed itself is apparently highly nutritious, but they throw that away. They just get that thin layer of pulp. Uh, I don't know if those of you who, who don't know Panama, if you know mamon or mamoncino or litchi fruit, it's kind of like that. You get this thin layer of pulp around this big nutritious seed. And then there's these terrible hairs, prickly hairs on the pulp. And then there's this hard capsule outside that. It is insane how much hard they work. And I've never tasted it because I don't want those hairs on my tongue. Um, so I don't even know if it tastes good, but yeah, they throw away the net, which seems like the best part. They just haven't figured out that's good to eat yet. And they just go for that, that teensy bit of pulp. I don't, I don't know, it does seem insane to me, but they're very, very motivated to do this. Next question is from Carolina Morales. Carolina. Well, she was telling me that she lost, she was having- I'm trouble. sorry. Oh, there you are. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I don't know if you answered this before, but you, early in the presentation, you showed um, a dynamic of fusion and fusion of uh, social groups. Is there any relationship with that uh, group dynamic with uh, social novelty realtors? Like, I have a new group, so I have to renovate my social relationships and maybe the way that I um, interact with them, with my new group. I didn't follow the last part of the question. I think you're saying, do certain individuals need a new strategy? What do you mean after they disperse to a new group or? After they form a new group or maybe that, um, yeah, they disperse and or they emigrate to another group. So maybe they can they can relate with the new group or maybe with the um, with the new one that I receive in my group um, from a new way, from a different way. Um, so are you asking like if their personality changes or whether they uh, adopt new behaviors or or what? What? Yeah, if they adapt new behavior in um, like social novelty. Um, I haven't noticed anything striking about that um, so far, but we, we have some, some analyses in progress that might help us to answer that. Um, we're, we're going to be working with this Sloania fruit, which is another extractive foraging technique and aiming to answer some, some questions kind of related to what you're you're asking, but um, that's, that's not done yet. Um, I can say that when they emigrate, when males emigrate, they will take behaviors with them, these bond testing behaviors, and they don't seem to stick in the new group. So they will continue to practice them with their co-migrants, but they don't seem to spread. That's something we've been hoping to know the answer to for a long time. And yeah, so far it looks like they, they don't transmit these behaviors to the new groups. Okay, so in the case of social novelty, um, it is expressed between two individuals that have a previous social bond uh, from, from before. Yeah, I was talking about there are two, two co-migrants and they will have a behavior that they practice, a bond testing ritual they practice and we, they'll move to a new group. And so we were wondering whether they would then transmit them to other members of that new group. And it seems that they do not. Okay. Thank you. The next question is from Antoinette, and I don't see your last name. Antoinette, can you please tell me your Kutumani, please? 
Um, thank you for this uh, interesting talk. My name is Antoinetta and I'm a master's student at Wageningen University. And uh, my question is uh, the social rituals that you've seen uh, between diet in uh, the diets. Do you see, for example, the individual that started the innovation to have other innovations with other types of diets? And if there is perhaps uh, a relation between the type of the diet and the uh, components of the social uh, innovation? You do see that networks form that have more similar elements. So for example, there will be an eye poking network. So rumor invented is the monkey who invented the eyeball poking. And then her friends will do that too. They'll gradually adopt that. But each diet will also have some different little bells and whistles attached. So each dyadic ritual is a bit different with regard to the roles they play um, and the sequence of behavioral elements incorporated. But yeah, they will have some really striking behaviors such as eyeball poking or hand sniffing or the hair biting um, that is in it. So you'll, you will have these, these, um, these networks with common elements. Is that kind of answering your question or? Uh, yes, I was thinking more in terms of, for example, if you have um, a mother and a daughter or uh, between siblings or between uh, friends, uh, if there's some kind of a different element that pertains to that particular diet. You mean like mother offspring as a class have different kinds of rituals compared to Male. Yeah, for example, if you see less uh, painful uh, behaviors, like um, instead of eye poking, you have a uh, hand sniffing between, for example, mother and offspring uh, instead of uh, uh, between friends, for example. I think that all of these dyad types are pretty much equally masochistic, but you uh. do see, um, for some reason, and I don't know if it's just coincidence, the games, the things that require multiple roles and more of a back and forth, tend to be seen more in male-male dyads. And um, a, I see more, it's not exclusive, but more of the hand sniffing and eye poking in the female-female dyads. But yeah, there is some, some crossover. Um, mm -hmm. But I think it, it might be enough of a tendency that there would be some kind of statistical difference between the males, male-male and female-female dyads. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's just historical accident or what, but, um, you know, these mm -hmm. innovations that don't come up that often and then they, turn into these long-term traditions and um, all stemming from that initial innovation event. Okay, thank you. The next question is from Clara Gretan. Yes, hi, <laughs> sorry. Um, yeah, I'm Clara Gretan from the University of Bern, also a graduate student. Thank you for the nice talk. Um, I was wondering if you found any evidence hinting at um, that the monkeys would use the number of friends as an alternative to um, get a higher rank within their group. I didn't quite understand the question. Use the number of friends as an alternative to what? So usually dominance is established by rather like a bodily, uh, like physical superiority. And I was just wondering if um, having more friends that you do rituals with would be a possibility for you to gain rank in comparison if you're physically weaker, weaker usually and would have a lower position. Mm -hmm. Well, definitely there's a lot of coalitionary aid involved in rank acquisition. So that for sure. I haven't analyzed the data to see whether um, rate of ritual, like number of partners with whom you perform rituals is a predictor of rank acquisition. That I don't know. Okay. Um, but yeah, they're very political monkeys and, and often we're just completely surprised by who ends up on top. If you look at the body size and you think, <laughs> how, how can this little puny monkey be alpha when this hulking brute is in the, in the wings here? Um, so yeah, th there is definitely a lot, of, a lot of coalitionary involvement in this process. All right, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, I'm gonna take my 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 slot that I skipped before for asking you a question that follows on Karsten's question about what you think could be the function of all these innovations and the impressive number that that seems to of innovations that come up. What what I think it's that's so exciting is that we, with the detail on, on the natural history that you've amassed, in a way you are you're you you're forcing us to think of changing the focus or the level of analysis for the, for the phenotype, phenotypic gambit that we're willing to take. 
So it, the, the function may not be, of course, we're not gonna, it'd be very challenging to find a function for each of the innovations you find, but, but you're now keeping an eye on personality. And there's a huge literature, at least for humans, on the genetic basis of personality types. So I wonder if what you have, and maybe you're already doing it, I wanted to ask you, have you started considering the possibility of understanding the genetic basis of the personality types that relate to the innovation? So, so I, I wouldn't be very hopeful that you'll find the function of any single innovation. But clearly what we have here is individuals who have different personalities and you have the exploratory type and you have the shy, shy type. And we know that that's probably, it's at that level, but much more mechanistic level that maybe selection is acting on. I mean, are, are you daring? Are you bold? Are you shy? So any progress on trying to get at the behavioral genetics of these personality types in relationship to the innovations? Yeah, Irene Godoy, uh, who was my graduate student is now a, a postdoc is, is uh, working on some animal models. Um, and so I think eventually we'll get to that point where starting out simple right now. I, as I, I guess Irene's not on Zoom, she's on YouTube, so she can't talk about that. But um, we hadn't really talked about trying to relate this to innovation frequency, but we are working on um, the personality aspects and the behavioral genetics of that. Thank you. Next question, David Wood. Hello again. Uh, I'm wondering if you, so for the year that I was at Lomas, I don't think I ever saw any real big costs from any of these weird social games like the finger in the eye or the finger in the nose. I guess there could be like covert costs, like small scratches or something that would still be costly. Um, but I'm wondering if in your vast experience, have you seen any really high costs for those behaviors? And I'm also curious how something like that started out. Like did, did these two friends just start putting their fingers like on the eye and then just had to keep escalating? Or did they just jump, you know, knuckle deep the first time? Mm -hmm. Okay, so regarding the costs, I mean, I think they are very careful who they do these things with. So um, I think they, they wouldn't try uh, eyeball poking with somebody that they've had a history of antagonism with, but they would try it with some, someone that they, they just want to know how enthusiastic they are about being their buddy right now. It's more at that level of the relationship. Um, I think that these, these costs obviously can happen. We see lots of monkeys are missing fingers. So clearly, and we know that they do have fingers bitten off. So we know that that is a potential cost, even though I have personally never seen a monkey be foolish enough to play one of these games with a monkey who did bite the finger off. So, um, and what was your second question? Oh, how they get started. Um, so thinking back to the origins of eyeball poking, um, which is probably the most interesting one because that's just, it just seems so painful and weird and you know, dirty fingernails and it, ugh. Um, it started off with a rumor sticking her own finger in her own eye and then hand sniffing and then gradually trying to use someone else's finger in her own eye. And then other monkeys would experimentally poke themselves in the eye before they were willing to have her finger in their eye. And so it was a period of months where of warm up before they were willing to do this mutual finger in each other's eye kind of thing. And in these rituals in general, there will be a lot of, you know, some one, one personality will be a little more forceful and really want to twist somebody's body around in uncomfortable ways. And that one may object. And there's just a lot of back and forth before they finally get into kind of a rut where they have a stable sequence of behaviors that they do together. Um, and, you know, each, I, I've toyed with the idea of writing a picture, uh, a paper about this process, but there is so much variation between dyads and how all these things unfold that. I kind of worry it would just have too much detail for anyone to want to read and no real firm uh, conclusion. Um, it's, it's hard, you know, the coding, figuring out what to code in these sequences is difficult. You know, what is it that really matters? It's hard to say in advance. So um, yeah, open suggestions and maybe I'll tackle that again someday. But the, the one time I tried to write such a paper, I became a little overwhelmed by the details as well. And also the variation data quality. You know, so we've got great video data for some and then we just have some narrations for others of variable quality, depending on the observer, it's, it's hard to, to know for sure what details got into each ritual, given the variety of ways in which the data were collected. 
So the like the final mature form of these rituals are all kind of the same, I guess, or, or just with the finger and eye, let's say, where one monkey would go and grab the other monkey's hand and push it in their eye, and then they just kind of sit there for a while. If that's the same across all of the dyads, are the ways that these rituals were negotiated between each dyad, the path to get to the same ritual was very different, you're saying? Yeah, well, and actually the final part is not necessarily the same. So you will have maybe several dyads that poke each other in the eye, but then some of them also insist on going uh, like that when they're doing it or, you know, having one finger up the nose and another in the eye. There's all kinds of little variations that they do. And, and each dyad has its own preferences for how to, like which, which little elements to combine in their personal eye poking ritual, for example. Very interesting. Thank you. We have a few more minutes for some more questions. If anybody has anything else, I mean, sorry, you can go again. Thanks for those of you who've already asked and you were kind of waiting for others to have a chance. I appreciate that, but now please, sorry, go ahead. Um, um, I have a question in a kind of totally different direction, more about practically, how do you maintain your field site? I mean, you're saying you have 13 monkey groups, which is a lot of monkeys. And you have, can you say something about how many assistants you have at any one, one time, how often groups are followed in a month, how often one particular individual then is observed in the so that because you do talk about that you have spread out like not that dense data per individual to answer some questions that Adriana, I believe, brought up. And then you have a grad student who did look in more detail at particular individuals. But if you kind of can talk a little bit, we have quite a bit of young researcher here in the audience and it just seems over, overtly daunting to maintain over 30 years a field site, the one you have, and then have this amazing details and like this etogram that is just scary to be perfectly <laughs> honest. <laughs> no, I agree, it's just scary and it's harrowing to run the site and I can't wait for um, one of my <clears throat> former graduate students to help me run it. But, um, and I'm jealous of Tim owning his field site. That would really be making lives a, a lot easier. But no, I, um, you know, funding cycles can go up and down and sometimes I can do a great job of things and other times we have to have big gaps. And I am actually, thanks to the COVID gap, deciding that I'm going to have to drop some of those groups and, you know, may, hopefully go back and just demographically monitor twice a year. But um, what I tried to do is maintain intensive focal sampling of my developmental study. Uh, unfortunately, these monkeys dispersed, like each one decided to every group fissioned and you know the males all went different places. So I ended up with way more groups than I ever intended to have because of trying to commit to monitoring these monkeys until they died and to get lifetime reproductive success. Uh, and then I tried to pick a couple of groups that are really good for whatever my current grant proposal project is and really focus on those while cutting back somewhat on, on the other groups so that I, I have just enough contact with them to not lose who's who. Um, and in the good old days when I was working with Max Planck, I had like nine volunteers regularly and could monitor three groups every day. Uh, now that I'm back uh, in the US with public funding, um, you know, it's a lot scarier. So there, there are little funding gaps where um, you know, we are living in appalling conditions um, and we have to move constantly because we're just renting from various landlords. There is no permanent field station where we can stay. So yeah, a lot of it is very daunting. Um, so, and having a long-term field manager is the best. That really helps a lot. But no, I spend about six hours a day micromanaging the site from afar. Um, and when I don't have a, a long-term manager and that takes a lot of time uh, that, that I can't spend analyzing the data I collect. As in terms of the research, um, like who's collecting the data, um, when I have really good funding, sometimes I can have long-term managers. I can sometimes have uh, local people who stay a while. Um, 
when I have no funding or very little funding, then we're relying on volunteers who come from around the world and, and stay for um, you know, maybe a year. And they help me train the next group to some extent. And then those people tend to become graduate students. I think we've had about close to 70 former field assistants become graduate students in primatology. And some of them come back, which is really great and do their PhDs with me or some postdoc work. So that's the basic setup. And yeah, it is harrowing. It's really hard to keep it running, um, unfortunately. Yeah, but also great um, uh, um, payoffs in that you, your reputation as a privatologist is, is very high. And people that work in the, in the Americas, I mean, you're one of the names that are well known and um, I would, yeah, I want to congratulate you on what you have accomplished because you're definitely someone to, to look up to. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if this is a question as much as just a couple of comments that I don't want, I'd like myself to make following on the question. Uh, I think it'd be fantastic if we can find some time to have a, a longer conversation. Uh, I imagine from my conversation with Susan that, that well, actually you alluded, Susan, to, to you kind of, to some extent, getting worried or looking for somebody who can help you. I mean, time flies. Uh, and I, I wonder about the future of the Almaki project. And I'm sure you wonder about the future of, of your project as well. It's already been 11 years since Tim Tim Klattenberg published that paper in Science about the importance of long-term projects. And I have tried, actually, Susan and I tried uh, to draw a little bit of inertia. How are we gonna make these things sustainable? Uh, I wanna be optimistic, I wanna, I'm delighted, I mean, to see so many young colleagues uh, dreaming and planning on getting started. Uh, but I, I, I feel like we, I'm so busy keeping the project running on a day-to-day -day basis that I'm not sure I'm spending enough time securing the continuity of the project, much less trying to do something about how our younger colleagues will find sources of support for, for the many new projects that Karsten was encouraging you all to start. Go and find a species that nobody has studied, start a project. So I'm just dropping the idea. I mean, should we try to find in everything we're doing some time for a little bit of a think tank cutting across countries and continents on some concrete little action we can do to, to imagine how these things are gonna be sustainable, not next year, but I'm really talking the next many decades because that that's, should be the horizon we have if we're thinking of our, our younger colleagues. And I just stop there, I don't know. The, the next question is from uh, Adriana. Hi again. Um, I forgot before. Uh, I'm Adriana Maldonado from Universidad de Rosario in Colombia. Um, this is the question. It's more about methodology, I would say, like on running the site and everything. So I didn't notice in your photos that you have any sort of individual marks, you know, like a collar or a tag or something. So you individually recognize them by any sort of marks on their, like natural marks on their faces or? That's right, yeah. And so that's what makes it hard and it was really scary when we had that COVID gap and we couldn't be down there. I think we pieced it all back together. But, um, you know, as they age, they get in fights and they, they get freckles and things like that, which are useful or a little tufts or the, the shape of the peak is, is different. Um, when we have new infants and they, they do so much adult parenting, we sometimes will squirt a little bit of hair dye on them to help us through that phase of life where they are not really sufficiently beaten up to be reliably recognized. Um, but we don't have any kind of permanent marks on them. And that's what makes it a little scary for me. I have to spend um, at least four months in the field every year doing regular dawn to dusk field work in order to make sure that the IDs are you know, constant that they're everybody's still calling the hollow monkeys by the correct names. Interesting. And then the second question kind of follows up on that because you also mentioned that whenever you get a new person in your team, it has to train for about three months before actually being able to collect data. So that's right. I'm wondering like how much burden does it 
take to the team. I mean, more than in the good sense, right? Because it's an investment in the future. But um, so it needs one person to take over one person, not a trainee. And then will the trainee go while the trainer is collecting actual data? Or is it like the trainer, it's going only to teach the trainee how to collect the data. And so you have two people out of collecting data that requires a lot more people than. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. Um, so normally we'd have two people per group, but when there's a trainee, we have a trainee with the two people. Uh, you know, and sometimes life doesn't cooperate and we have to have just a um, trainer and a trainee. And um, we may have to just have that trainer dictaphone everything and transcribe it later, which they hate. It takes so much time. It's like Groundhog Day. You have to relive the entire day again the next day and write it all down. Um, so, but yeah, in, when things are running well, you have this trio, trainee and trained team, and you're, you're training them as you're collecting data. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Awesome. But yeah, it is really awful when somebody flakes out in month four or something, you know, you've just invested all of this time in training them and then they leave. It's just, it's just really horrible. So no, I can see why this should be like a year. It's like a lot of, effort. yeah, it really has to be at least a year for it to be worth our while to spend all that time training them. Mm -hmm. okay. Awesome. Thanks. Sam. Okay. We have, we're going to use our very last minute for the last question. I really want to honor our YouTube colleagues. So David, if you have the question from YouTube, please. This is a question from Claudia de la O from Universidad Latina in Mexico. She says, thank you for this talk. My question is, do you think boredom, whatever such mentalistic construction would mean, may play some role in social innovation? Yeah, possibly. Mm -hmm. And in other kinds of innovation as well. Um, it, certainly we see in captive animals that they invent a lot more stuff than we see wild animals inventing. And one idea is that they're just bored and they don't have anything else to do. So they mess around with stuff and come up with new things. Um, you know, it's hard to distinguish between, uh, as we were saying before, the, the necessity to learn and the um, excessive free time hypotheses there, but yeah, quite likely. Well, with that, I want to thank Susan for a wonderful presentation, full of data, full of, of very, very useful methodological details and some wonderful insights into the personality and psychology of these capuchins. Thank you all. We've seen many new faces. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the questions. Uh, and here we're going to stop with the, the formal meeting time. Remember that we're meeting again next Tuesday, next time with a report for the from the working group on how to bring the fine seminar on to teaching animal behavior. Those of you, I mean, we sometimes hang out a little bit longer. Uh, so if you want to stay, please, you, we can do that. Otherwise, uh, go on to your next Zoom meeting. That seems like all we have to do these days. And we'll see you next week. Susan, so uh, yeah, like I said, if you need to take a little break, I, I usually, I, I, I'm exhausted and I'm not the speaker. So the <laughs> time of these two hours, just keeping track of the questions and this and that, it, it's so tiring. Uh, but those of you, if, if some of you stay, we can also chat some more. Uh, I just wanted, I mean, the last question about from Sari, uh, it's so, so dear to me, and I'm glad to see that Tim is hanging here with us. Uh, I, I wonder, Tim, if you can motivate us, help us motivate our young colleagues who are trying to imagine how on earth do I have the next the, the mere cat project of the 22nd century. Or, so uh, I really think that, that we're not doing enough going to the private sector. Uh, we, we have started at Yale. Let me share, I mean, some, somewhat parallel to this. Uh, Yale, three years ago, started a science initiative, a university-wide initiative to imagine the science that's gonna happen at Yale for the next many, many decades. And, and the, the university-wide committee came up with a number of, I think it was about five top uh, recommendations or, or points to work on. And one of them is how we're gonna fund grad students. And it came from acknowledging that the public sources of funding for imagining graduate school don't look very promising. Imagining that we're gonna keep 
being able to taking grad students and give them a paycheck for five years, no questions asked. So that's why I'm saying the parallel with how much longer? I mean, it's hard to be very optimistic. I try to be realistic, not, not falling down to being pessimistic, but the idea that we're gonna keep having funding from NSF uh, to support the kind of projects that I feel we have or Susan have, where we cannot take gaps, where we really have infrastructure, year round personnel, uh, I, I really think that I feel like I'm not doing enough exploring private options, but I'd like to hear from those of you who are experiencing similar challenges. Uh, or Sorry, Eduardo, did you want to turn off the YouTube live stream? Okay. 